today we shall discuss about the bus structure that is how a CPU communicates with memory and devices. So, for this communication CPU uses bus. Bus is a mechanism by which CPU communicates with memory and I O devices. And it is not just a collection of wires. In fact, bus defines a protocol for communication. In fact, you can say that if bus is a transport device, then the bus in the context of embedded system or computers is also defining the corresponding transport mechanism between the CPU and memory and I O devices. So, typically bus is a shared communication link because there are many devices which can actually sit on the bus. A single set of wires are therefore used to connect multiple subsystems. Bus is also a fundamental tool for composing large and complex systems. Why? Because bus defines the mechanism for communication and once I have to put in a complex subsystem along with CPU, that subsystem should have the ability to communicate with the communication scheme specified by the bus. So, a bus enables us to build a system on the basis of individual components which are compatible with the bus. Here we have shown an example and in this example the interesting thing to note is that I have shown not one bus, two, but two buses. One bus connecting memory and the processor, another bus input and output devices to the processor. We may have this kind of two distinct buses or else we can have a single bus and both memory and input and output devices sitting on the same bus itself. So, what defines a bus? All these aspects are important for definition of the bus. First is transaction protocol, how really the exchange of data takes place along the bus, how the devices really talk to each other, what is the language by which they talk to each other. And for talking, you need to have the timing and signaling specification. And these signals are obviously carried by a bunch of wires. So, I have the electrical specification for the signals which are carried by bunch of wires. But where will these wires actually lie? That is defined by physical or mechanical characteristics as well as the nature of the connectors. So, starting from mechanical to the top level transaction protocol, all these things together constitutes a bus. A generic bus structure will have obviously address, data and control. So, I am showing the number of uh, lines that I can have for address, for data, for control A, M, N and C and accordingly I shall be setting up the connection or the communication link. So, what for are the control lines? Control lines actually implements the transaction protocol. The signals which flow along the control lines are really instrumental in implementing the transport protocol. The signals requests and acknowledgements. So, these are requests and acknowledgement signals are the two basic and generic type of signals you will find on the bus. Also, the signals indicate what type of information is on the data lines. Data lines carry information between the source and the destination. In fact, we have clubbed data and address together because address is nothing but a special form of data. Also, there may be complex commands which may be given to devices through data lines through the bus. Bus signals are usually tri-stated. Now, why tri-stated? 
because when a particular uh, device, let's consider the interface of the device to the bus. So, if a device would like to disconnect itself from the bus, it would drive its interface lines to tri state, high impedance state. So, effectively, it gets disconnected from the bus. Since all these devices are really sharing the common set of signal lines, so typically bus signals are tri stated. In many cases, address and data lines may be multiplexed. This would save on the number of actual connections or wires. The other interesting thing to be noted that every device on the bus must be able to drive the maximum bus load, okay? because maximum bus load would determine what are the, what is the maximum number of device that you can actually put on the bus. Okay? So, it has to drive the bus wires and other bus devices to deliver the signal. So, that is the compatibility with regard to the drive. Bus may include a clock signal. It is not necessary that all the buses are clocked, but some of the buses do include clock signal and all the timing, timing particularly for bus signals which implement the complete communication protocol is defined relative to the bus clock. Now, bus clock may not be same as that of the system clock of the processor. Here we are showing the time multiplexing. So, when there is a single signal line which is used for carrying two kinds of signals, we do have time multiplexing. I am showing here a master, another is a servant device. Now, master is requesting the servant to receive data or to get data from and the data is flowing here. Now, the interestingly, there is no address pass. That is where will these data be stored by the servant it, there is not being specified by a separate address lines. What is happening is the same data lines which is of 8 bit width is being used for this purpose. So, see how it has been done in this case. So, you have the address as well as the data. So, when you first send the request, you have the address which is being sent. Next time, with the next request, you are sending the data. So, the address and data is getting synchronized with respect to the request signal. In this case, what is happening is the master is likely to transfer 16 bit data, but you have got 8 data lines available. So, you have to do multiplexing. So, with the first request, you are sending the more significant byte and then you are sending the less significant byte. It can be other way also. So, what you can see is here the 16 bit transfer, I would have required 16 lines instead of that I am doing it using 8 lines, but obviously I am saving wares at the expense of time because I would require 2 clock periods for transferring 16 bit data. Now, obviously, I would like to increase the bus bandwidth. The way I have shown, if I am using time multiplexed uh, uh, mechanism for transferring data or address and data, the basic limitation that comes is with regard to the bus bandwidth. So, obviously, if I do a non multiplexed address and data lines, I shall have increased bus bandwidth. So, you have got more bus lines okay, and increase complexity in terms of the physical layout as well as the space requirement. The other option is increasing data bus width. In fact, this is done in many of the mainframe systems. That means, you increase the width of data bus and transfers of multiple words therefore, will require fewer bus cycles. So, consider a system is uh, having its basic word length to be 16 bits, but it is sitting on a bus of say 64 bits. 
a bus which can support 64 bit data lines. And if you are really doing a sequential access to the memory, you can transfer 4 words in one bus cycle. So, effectively increasing the bandwidth of the bus. But obviously, here the drawback is you are using additional wear. The other option is block transfers. Allow the bus to transfer multiple words in back to back bus cycles. This is also using the same concept of sequential address. That is, I shall just provide a single address and then I shall do a number of this data transfer cycles. So, only one address needs to be sent at the beginning and the bus is not released until the last word is transferred. Obviously, the logically this has an increased complexity and decreased response time for request. Request from whom? From the other devices which are willing to use the bus. But for a transfer, you can have a large volume of data transfer and a fast data transfer. In fact, if you remember DRAMs and I said I had illustrated use of sequential signal from ARM for accessing the DRAM, that is you do a row select and then transfer the data from the row buffer for all columns sequentially, that can be very easily done through a block transfer mechanism. So, what are the advantages of bus? Since we are using a bus, we have an agreement of the communication protocol. So, new devices can be added easily. It is not that each device is having its peculiar communication protocol. If you have a one to one connection, then each device can have its own communication protocol and then its implementation in terms of connecting into the processor will become more complex. It is a low cost because a single set of wires is shared in multiple ways depending on the requirement of the device. What are the disadvantages? It obviously creates the communication bottleneck. Although we had started from the time multiplexed organization and talked about ways and means of increasing bus bandwidth, but the bandwidth of the bus can actually limit the maximum IO throughput and that can actually be the limitation on the processing capability, okay? not really processing capability, but output of the processor. So, if you, if you may have a processor working at 2.4 gigahertz, but if it is not getting data at a rate more than 133 megahertz, then obviously, you are not using the processor to its full potential. So, bus can be that kind of a bottleneck. The maximum bus speed is largely limited by length of the bus and the number of devices on the bus. And there is a need to support a range of devices with widely varying latencies and widely varying data transfer rates because these are the inherent limitations of the devices. Because I am looking at a bus, if we look at the simplest picture of the model of the bus, where we are having a single bus and in the single bus I have memory and other devices hanging from it. So, in that case, uh, the latencies are different because the devices would take different times to become ready to put the data on the bus and there will be widely varying data transfer rates as well. So, we shall see there are various ways by which we can try to minimize this kind of disadvantages. The other way we can look at bus is so far the key model or the basic model by which we have looked at is more of a parallel communication. That is multiple data control and possibly power wires and effective data transfer unit is one bit per wire. So, this is useful for high data throughput with short distances and typically used when connecting devices on same IC or, say or same circuit board. The motivation is these buses must be kept short because long parallel wires 
will result in high capacitance values which requires more time to charge and discharge that will limit the data transfer rate and data misalignment between wires increases as the length increases okay because there is a capacitive cost associated with each wire so higher cost means bulky so this is what is a classical model where we have parallel lines defining the bus and uh, you will find that uh, particularly when we are talking about a system or a general purpose computer system uh, the bus on your motherboard is typically a parallel bus because these buses are expected to run for shorter length but you will find when we are looking at embedded systems it's not always that devices are connected by this kind of parallel buses because you can realize that if I have these parallel buses and so many signal lines then there are lots of problems which we need to face a problem would be that of the space just consider that peak as a microcontroller which has got inbuilt peripherals and it has to support some external peripherals as well if it supports a full fledged parallel bus by which external peripherals can be connected then it has to provide a large number of external pins so that is an area requirement even for the device itself putting so many connection lines can actually ask for additional physical area even so the other option that we have is serial communication serial protocols and a very few lines for doing the actual communication you may have a single data wire possibly also a single control and power wires words are transmitted one bit at a time so effectively you have a higher data throughput with longer distances because your capacitive load does not build up because since you have multiple parallel lines long parallel lines there will be mutual capacitance which actually reduces or puts constraint in the <coughs> transfer rate <coughs> so my bus is cheaper it is less bulky you have got more complex interfacing logic and communication protocol sender <coughs> needs to decompose word into bits for serial communication receiver needs to recompose bits into word and control signals are often sent on the same wire as data so that increases protocol complexity because you do not have separate data or control lines you might like to use the same line to send the control information followed by data and since sender needs to why sender needs to decompose what it to bits because it has to send the words in a bit by bit fashion the other way of looking at bus is whether a bus is a synchronous bus or an asynchronous bus a synchronous bus includes a clock in control lines so you have a fixed protocol for communication that is relative to the clock that means the timing for your uh, signals control signals are defined always relative to that of the clock since it is defined with respect to the clock you can understand that your logic can be simple and it can run very fast disadvantage is every device on the bus must run at the same clock rate means it should have the ability to deliver data at the same clock rate and to avoid clock skew they cannot be long if they are fast because the skew will build up if the skew build up then there will be timing errors for data transfer so you will find that both processor memory buses which are expected to be fast buses in such cases you have synchronous bus but otherwise when you are really using peripherals the buses are not strictly synchronous bus 
So, you got to have what we call asynchronous bus. Asynchronous bus is not strictly clocked. Since it is not clocked, it can accommodate wide range of devices, they can work with different latencies, they need not respond with respect to the same clock. The bus can be lengthened without worrying about the clock skew, but it definitely requires a, what we call a handshaking protocol, so that these devices can talk to the processor in a proper fashion. <coughs> so, this takes us to the concept of protocols on the bus. So, what we say a protocol, the basic element of a protocol is bus transaction. A bus transaction includes two parts, request and action. So, typically a request consists of a command and an address, an action is basically transferring of data. Master in fact, we have already seen a master and a slave in a previous diagram in a time multiplexed bus organization. Master is the one who starts the bus transaction by issuing the command and address. Slave is the one who responds to the address by sending data to the master, if the master asks for data or receives data if the master wants to send data. But the devices which are lying on the bus, they are not assigned, they may not be assigned permanently to this master and slave role. A slave in one transaction can become master in some other transaction. Next question come is that of bus arbitration. How is the bus reserved by a device that wishes to use it? If there is a single master, that is the simplest system when we say processor is the only bus master, then really arbitration problem is not there. But uh, if the slave and the master can have interchangeable role, then we really need an arbitration scheme. But let us start looking at master slave arrangement. So, in case of a master slave arrangement, only the bus master can control access to the bus, it initiates and controls all bus requests. A slave responds to read and write requests. And in the simplest uh, system of this master slave arrangement, I told you is the processor based system. But here the major drawback is the processor is involved in every transaction. Okay? You might not like to have processor involved in all the transactions. <coughs> so, let us look at the basic transactions protocol. This master and this is a servant. This is called a stroke protocol. In fact, what is interesting to note is that this is what we were looking at when we were looking at the multiplexed bus. So, there is a request line and your data transfer is synchronized with respect to your request. Okay? So, what we say the basic protocol steps are master asserts request to receive data, servant puts data on bus within a time t axis. Master receives data and then D asserts request, servant becomes ready for next request. So, this one will, will work once these devices can guarantee the response within a bounded T axis. The other one is what is called a handshaking protocol, where you have a request acknowledge as a kind of a paired signal. So, master asserts request to receive data. Servant puts data on bus and sends and asserts acknowledge. Okay? So, master receives data and D asserts request, servant becomes ready for the next request. So, here what we are telling is 
the master as its request to receive the data. The servant puts the data and also tells the master that it has put the data. Okay, so, it says the servant puts data on bus and asserts ACK. So, when the master gets ACK, it knows that data is available. Okay? So, master receives data and then it will de asserts request okay? and then only the servant becomes ready for the next request. So, obviously, you can understand this is an purely asynchronous protocol. So, there can be a strobe or handshake combination. Okay. So, this is a combination what we say the first response case where we have introduced an additional signal line called weight. In fact, we have talked about weight when we discussed the arm interfacing with the memory. That arm need to wait for ROM access because it is slow. So, that is exactly what is being handled by this weight signal. The same thing is being now handled and we are talking this not in the context of just a particular chip or a particular processor, we are talking about it in the context of a common signal line which is connecting processor and different devices as well. <coughs> so, for a first response case, there is no need for the weight line to become active because this is a typical strobed access because I am guaranteed to provide the data within a T access time. If I am not guaranteed to provide the data, what is important is weight. Now, weight signal comes from the servant, weight asks the processor to weight. Okay. So, what we say that the master asserts request to receive data, servant cannot put data within T access, so it asserts weight acknowledge, it is almost like an acknowledge signal. Servant puts data on bus and D asserts weight, master receives data and D asserts request, so the servant becomes ready for next request. So, this is a kind of a, a strobe handshake combination. So, the question is obviously, when to use handshake? When response time obviously cannot be guaranteed in advance. There would be data dependent delay and there would be component variations and in fact, this is what we had already seen that SRAM can put the data within the T axis corresponding to a single cycle requirement for ARM, but this cannot is not true for ROM. So, there has to be wet cycles inserted. In fact, we shall look at this, this whole protocol uh, in the context of a bus, ISA bus protocol. In fact, ISA is actually a bus standard which came in the context of PC, it is an industry standard architecture. Now, one point you have to understand is all these bus protocols and all these things have to be standardized and standardized by by an agreement in the industry, because there will be individual developers of the device and memory as well as the processor. If they cannot agree on a same bus protocol or the same bus definition, their devices will not be usable across multiple platforms. So, this is just an example, because our bus specification is much more complex. This is just a simple example of a memory access. So, since it was developed originally keeping in mind 8086 kind of processor, so it has got a uh, 820 bit address. It uses what we call compromised strobe handshake control that is weight state based control. It has 4 cycles by default unless channel ready is de asserted resulting in additional weight cycles. It can there will be up to 6 weight cycles can be inserted. So, effectively what we are seeing here is a memory read bus cycle. So, this is the basic clock. Okay. Now, this read it is not a single clock read, it is a 4 cycles by default is allocated for each operation. Okay. And uh, since this is a read bus cycle, the address is put in. It may be 
it actually has got a multiplexed address pass, so that is why there is an ALE signal address latch enabled. Because if you are using a multiplexed bus, what happens? You are first putting the address, but address should remain valid when you are either reading or writing the data. So, this address has to be latched at the input of the memory device. Okay. So, you have a control signal address latch enabled. Then you have this memory read, this is telling the over the bus that you are actually executing a memory read cycle. Now, since the device is not ready, so the channel ready is like a wet signal which is going low. Okay. So, it is de-asserted resulting in an additional wet state and then when it goes up, the next cycle in the clock, the data becomes available. In fact, I have not shown, but the duration, the standard specifies exactly the timing parameters with respect to each of these transitions. And when it says that there can be up to 6 wait cycles, it implies the devices which are slower than these are not expected to be connected via ISA bus. Similarly, I have got a memory write bus cycle. Okay. Here, the control signal is memory write bar. Otherwise, the everything is identical. In fact, you have a channel ready is deserted. So, following this you have got a wait clock cycle and then you actually do the operations in subsequent cycles. ISA bus, although we have it developed in the context of PC, we shall see later on that a variant of it is used today in embedded systems as well. Next, we shall look at arbitration for multiple potential bus masters. So far, we were happy to have one master, one or more slaves. Now, there can be multiple bus masters. So, bus arbitration schemes usually try to balance two factors, what we call bus priority, because the devices would be now associated with priority. So, the highest priority device should be serviced first and there should be a fairness, even the lowest priority device should never be completely locked out from the bus. Bus arbitration schemes can be divided into four broad classes, daisy chain arbitration, centralized or parallel arbitration, distributed arbitration by self selection, each device wanting the bus places a code indicating its identity on the bus and distributed arbitration by collision detection. Each device just goes for it and problems are found after, after, after uh, they have started the process. So, this is exactly what is your networking protocol of uh, uh, CSMSCD. Okay. We shall primarily look at these two in today's discussion. <coughs> First is daisy chain. Daisy chain is there is a bus arbiter, this is not necessarily the processor, but it is a separate processing element which is there along with the bus. These are the devices and all these devices are can be potentially bus master. Now, what happens is when these devices want the bus, they will generate a request. Now, these request lines are connected via WAD OR. Okay. You will find that this is a request line and these request lines are connected via WAD OR. Okay. And bus arbiter depending on its uh, availability of the bus cycles, it will generate the grant signal. Now, this grant signal is not connected to all of them in parallel, but it ripples through just like a ripple counter, it ripples through. So, the ground signal goes to first the device which is nearest to the bus arbiter. Now, if it has generated the request, what it will do? It will not allow the ground signal to ripple through. Okay. So, it will now make use of the bus. Once it is done with, it will generate the release signal to tell bus arbiter that my job is over. So, obviously, the priority is defined according to the order in which these devices are put on the bus. 
okay now this is also used for servicing multiple device interrupts when all of them are connected on the same interrupt line and connected to the processor under those conditions also daisy chaining is used the advantage is this this arbitration scheme is very simple straightforward it is based on the physical uh, location of the device with respect to the arbiter but it cannot assure fairness a low priority device may be locked out indefinitely and the use of daisy chain grant signal also limits the bus speed because this grant signal has to ripple through so it is not available in parallel to all of them so each of these device will introduce a delay and that will be the limiting factor on the bus speed On the other side, I can have a centralized parallel arbitration. The basic difference here is each device has got uh, its own control lines, okay? the, <clears throat> when it requests and it gets its grant. So obviously, when a grant is generated, this is generated in a device specific fashion. And uh, it is used, obviously you can see this can be a very high speed bus, obviously I need to have a complex pass arbitration logic, but it can be very high speed and used in essentially all processor memory buses and high speed I O buses. Okay. And uh, the drawback of this would be a number of signal lines and I would require a complex logic. Now how to deal with priority? This is uh, a basic issue because we are talking about priority. So, there are two kinds of priority. I can have a fixed priority so that each peripheral has an unique rank. The highest rank chosen first when there are simultaneous requests. This is particularly true when we are looking at this kind of uh, parallel arbitration scheme. It is preferred when there is a clear difference in rank between peripherals. The other option is rotating priority. Priority is changed based on history of servicing that currently which is being serviced joins at the end of the queue and that is a basic principle of round robin priority. This has got better distribution of servicing especially among peripherals with similar priority demands. Okay. So, ties are not getting resolved arbitrarily, ties are getting resolved in a rotating fashion. So, the basic structure wise we will have something like this, we are just showing an example of priority arbitration scheme for dealing with interrupts. Okay. So, this is a processor and these peripherals, so this is uh, these peripherals would like the access of the bus and when they are ready they generate this interrupt requests. In fact, these kind of priority arbiter are components of all these uh, interrupt controllers that you have with variety of microprocessors and microcontrollers that you use. So, these peripherals would generate interrupt requests. Now, this priority scheme is not that of the interrupt priority scheme of the processor. This is a priority scheme which is assigned by the to the peripherals by the priority arbiter and the way you program the priority arbiter. So, depending on the priority of the interrupts, the priority arbiter will generate the interrupt. So, what we have shown here is if you look at there, I have marked it as number 2 because this is a peripheral controller. So, there would be actually a request coming from the actual device to the peripheral for doing the servicing. So, peripheral generates the interrupt request, the priority arbiter now raises the interrupt. So, appropriately if they processor is ready, it will generate the acknowledge signal. When the acknowledge is available, the priority arbiter would generate the acknowledge signal to the peripheral, it will generate only to that peripheral which is currently scheduled to receive service according to the priority okay? and that will lead to the actual system bus transfer. So, the steps involved is microprocessor is executing its program. Peripheral needs servicing, so assert this request. Peripheral 2 also can assert this request. The priority arbiter sees at least one request input, so asserts interrupt. 
Microprocessor stops executing its program and stores its state. The microprocessor asserts interrupt acknowledge and priority arbiter asserts IAC1 to acknowledge the peripheral one. Now, peripheral one puts its intra vector address on the system bus because the, proce the processor needs to know which peripheral it is going to service. So, peripheral now puts the address of the corresponding ISR. Okay. The microprocessor jumps to address of ISR read from data bus and ISR executes and returns microprocessor resumes executing its program. In fact, this is the scheme. In fact, if you remember when we talked about various levels of interrupts, we discussed this in the context of peak as well. So, when there are various levels of interrupts, this is how the interrupt arbitration is done with respect to the devices. Now, how can you increase the transaction rate on multi master bus? Because you have seen you always when there is a multi master bus, the basic problem is that you actually pay for your protocol to dissolve who is the current requesting device who will become the master. So, the one way of doing it is by exploiting the basic principle of pipeline pipelining, but in a different context. What do we say that there can be arbitration for next transactions during current transaction? Because in the current transaction actually we are transferring the data, but we can actually finish up arbitration beforehand, because when the arbitration is taking place, the signal lines which are involved may not be strictly involved during the data transfer. Next thing is what is called bus parking. Master holds on to bus and performs multiple transactions as long as no other master makes request. That means, there is no for each transaction there is no priority resolution. Priority resolution only takes place on demand. Obviously, that would require more complex logic for priority arbitration. You can understand so this is something like this that if my priority arbitration block or the logic is something like a processor. So, that processor will be interrupted when there is a request from another device. Then only it will execute the priority arbitration script. If there is no such request, then the current master will continue to remain master for next cycles and next transactions will take place without arbitration and hence there would be faster data transfer. There is overlapped address and data phases because you are providing the address and data. So, these both these things since you are using what? You are using non multiplex lines if you are using non multiplex lines address and data phases can actually be overlapped. There is other interesting thing which is something like a split phased bus. Okay. These are more sophisticated bus protocols which have which have come in. So, in a packet switched it is it is more like a packet switch network and when we talk about an interconnection framework between number of devices this kind of a packet switching can take place. So, you have completely separate address and data phases we are not talking about only buses, but we are talking about completely separate address and data phases and they arbitrate separately for each. So, address phase yields a tag which is matched with data phase. So, what does that mean? It is something like this I send first an address a very simplistic picture would be I would first send an address on the basis of the address a device gets selected. So, device pro provides a tag when the data is being sent the data contains a tag. Okay. So, tag is matched and data is received. So, you can have this uh, data transfer with regard to each of these requirements okay. fine and uh, see all of these above in most modern memory buses because they are actually 
the bottleneck of speed really comes in. Now, in this context, why you should understand this basic packet switching is why it is interesting and why it you should note in this context is so far whatever we have discussed in terms of bulk transaction protocol, it is very very similar to a kind of a circuit switching scenario because your lines are getting dedicated to a particular device for a set of transactions that set may include a single transaction as well. But when we are doing a pack packet switching, it is not like that. Okay. So, your number of data packets are actually flowing on the bus, fine. Depending on the tag which is available with the data, the devices will accept the data. So, truly speaking, it is not that is for communication between CPU to a device or device 1 to device 2, the circuit is not getting completely allocated or dedicated for this transfer. Let us look at direct memory transfer because this is the most common form of having multiple bus master. Okay. That is when we use a DMA controller because the DMA is what? We are bypassing the CPU to transfer the data from peripheral to the memory. And you are using a DMA controller and DMA controller is strictly speaking a single purpose processor which can take over the control of the bus. So, in the very common and the low end systems, DMA controller would be the most important other device to become bus master. So, microprocessor relinquishes control of the system bus to DMA controller and while DMA controller is carrying out the data transfer, microprocessor can execute its regular program. So, what we have is no inefficient and storing and restoring of state due to ISR call. You should keep that in mind because always the ISR has got associated with this the latency and storage uh, in the memory and time uh, which goes in for this kind of state storage and retrieval that interrupt latency overhead that gets completely eliminated if I use DMA for this kind of data transfer. Further regular program need not wait unless it requires a system bus because if it is a pipeline processor and if it has already fetched the instructions, it can continue execution of its instructions while there is a data transfer on the external bus between memory and peripheral. And this is so, it is very interesting in the context of a hardware architecture because processor can fetch and execute instructions because its instruction memory is different from data and memory. And when you are transferring a data from peripheral, okay, you will be transferring the data to data memory and not to the instruction memory. In fact, this is another reason why you have found that today's microcontrollers which are targeted for embedded systems pick up Harvard architecture because you can have parallel data transfer from slow peripherals while execution of the code can really continue by fetching instructions from instruction memory. So, how does this whole process, what is the protocol for this kind of a DMA transfer? So, if P1 is a peripheral, it receives input data and register with maybe an address 8000. So, this is and this DMA control with uh, data and register. So, now that data has to be transferred. This is a simple example. So, DMA controller, what it does? It asserts DMA request for the control of the system bus. Okay. Now, if I go through the timing sequence, if I look at here, a C, the microprocessor is executing its own program after configuring the DMA control registers. What does the DMA control registers need to know? Need to know definitely the target address where the data has to be stored. DMA controller also needs to know from which peripheral or which peripheral ports this data may be read and put into memory. So, the first you actually configure the DMA, DMA controller and then DMA controller can receive a request from actual peripheral device. <coughs> So, the step number 2 is the peripheral device asserts request to request servicing by the DMA controller. Okay, this is a step number 2. 
the st step number three would is that after receiving this request from peripheral because peripheral is not requesting now not the processor but dma controller for the transfer okay so this comes to dma controller dma controller now sends request to the processor the processor releases the system bus whenever it can in fact it says that here we are looking at an example after executing an instruction in many cases processors can relinquish bus even while executing an instruction so you need not wait till the end of the instruction okay it asserts the dma acknowledge in fact dac okay when it asserts the dma acknowledge the dma controller okay uh, asserts acknowledge reads data and writes a data to a memory location so this could be a memory location where it is uh, to be written then the sixth step is dma d asserts t request and acknowledge completing handshaking with the pi so because it has already it has to tell already the peripheral that your job is done i have done your job and this when it dias at DAC, so processor knows dma controller no longer needs a bus so it can reclaim the bus okay so 7a is told this to the dma controller and 7b is that peripheral d asserts the request because the request now is its job is done so it should no longer request the dma controller to provide this service so you can see that whole dma transfer is a coordination from peripheral to cpu via dma controller and while actual transfer takes place dma controller becomes a master so it generates who generates memory address dma controller generates memory address when actually the dma transfer takes place so if i look at the dma bus cycle okay this is for i isa dma bus cycle you will find that both control signals the other part of it is same that your address and the data part is same the address is now getting generated by whom it is getting generated by the dma controller but interestingly you will find that you are asserting both io read and memory write signals why because you have to read data from the peripheral so you are asserting io read and that data has to be read to the memory so you are asserting memory write the other corresponding to, uh, thing should happen when it is a memory read bus cycle now i I had already talked about the disadvantage of the bus if there are various devices, devices with various kinds of latencies. So one solution to this problem is what is called multi-level bus architectures. Because if you have one bus for all communication, in fact this is the basic disadvantage I talked about earlier, peripherals would need high speed processor specific bus interface, which is not possible always to provide, because then the cost of the peripheral devices would increase. That means it would lead to excess gates power consumption and cost and less portable so these are these you would not like to have in fact this is more true in the context of embedded systems and too many peripherals putting on the same bus slows down the bus so one solution is you have hierarchical bus structure what we call a processor local bus and a peripheral bus so processor local bus is where your microprocessor that is your CPU, your cache memory, memory controller, DMA controller, all these things really sit. Okay? And on the peripheral bus, you have the peripherals and the two buses communicate via what we call a bridge. So you have got processor local bus, which is high speed, most frequent communication on this bus, which connects this microprocessor, cache and memory. And you have a bridge which is a single purpose processor which converts communication between the buses. In fact, in many uh, bus standards, it will actually accumulate a number of transactions together from a slower bus and then post it to the high speed bus. The similar thing, it will do it from high speed to the low speed bus. Peripheral bus is what is of a lower speed and typically you follow some industry standards for the purpose of portability. The most well known and the common hierarchical bus structure today is PCI bus, peripheral component interconnect bus. Okay? It is a pretty high speed bus because it can have a data transfer rates of these 
and as a 32 bit ad, uh, addressing because you are using Pentium as a processor. It uses synchronous bus architecture, but still it has got multiplexed data and address lines. What is the basic protocol of that bus? Basic protocol is based on the architecture. Okay. In the architecture, you have got the basic CPU bus, okay, which is high speed bus. You have got PCI bus as well as you have got ISA bus, which we are talking so far for connecting the low speed device. And between each one of them, you have got the corresponding bridge. This is the host bridge between CPU bus, which, which is of the high speed and that of the PCI bus, the basic bus and that of the ISA bridge for bridging between PCI and ISA, uh, ISA bus. Obviously, L2 cache is sit on the CPU bus, but for trying to write onto the DRAM, it will go via the host bridge because DRAM is a slower device. So, your L2 and L1 cache are on the bus, CPU bus, but your ROM, your DRAM are connected via PCI host bridge because they are slower device. So, what we say the all signals in this PCI bus are sampled on rising edge and follows a centralized parallel arbitration and all transfers are nothing but busts. An address phase starts by asserting frame, frame is a basic signal and next cycle initiate, initiated as its command and address. That means, it is something like a complete cycle transfer. So, frame, the address phase starts by the frame and then you have the command uh, and, as, and the address for the next frame. And the transfer is through busts and you follow a centralized parallel arbitration scheme that we had already discussed. Data transfers are, uh, are done with regard to two signals, I ready and TR ready. When the, this is asserted when the master is ready to transfer, this is asserted when the target is ready to transfer and transfer when both asserted on rising edge. I hope you can understand that the master is ready to transfer and the device has to agree, then only you can have the transfer. The frame hash is de-asserted when master intends to complete only one more data transfer. The PCI variants for embedded systems are PC104, which is actually ISA bus and PC104 plus, which is actually both ISA and PCI. In fact, PC104, the basic issue is that for all these buses, ISA and PCI bus, they have the same identical signal definitions and the protocols when we look at in the context of embedded systems. The only difference is their size becomes small, the footprint becomes small. I told you it is critical to note that size, the mechanical parameters are becomes important for the bus. This is an example where mechanical parameters have been taken care of for the purpose of embedded applications. In fact, this is used for what are called single board computers. This was pioneered by Intel okay, and to make use of your Pentium processor for embedded applications and they reduce defined a bus which can be fitted into a small mechanical footprint okay, so that it can be very easily used for various embedded applications. So, the whole idea is that all flexibility and power of a PC with very small space requirements, that was the motivation. So, you can have real, really a software development without being bothered about knowing new hardware. So, this is what we have learned today, the basically the bus, how it connects CPU and IO devices. There may be more than one bus master. And we need arbitration in that case. And we have looked at single board computers where we have got a PC bus moved into an embedded system application. The next level is system on chip where you have got multiple processor and other things putting into one single silicon. Then how the bus would look like in that context. The other thing which we have not looked at so far is the serial buses for connecting peripherals to this embedded microcontrollers. This we shall look at next few classes.